I promise you, you are not going to want to miss this episode of the Houndsman XP podcast. I'm in South Texas with Shorty Gorham, and uh, Shorty and I sat down with a houndsman from South Texas named Travis Land. And while Travis is a, a deer recovery specialist, there's so much more to his story than just using hounds to find deer he comes from uh, generations of houndsmen in south texas and he has now migrated over into recovering deer on ranches for clients um, deer recovery dogs and it's it's a story that i never expected uh, but we got into so many different conversations around tracking deer that uh, any person that's a houndsman is going to benefit from listening to this. A deer, even if you're not a houndsman, if you're a deer hunter, you need to listen to this podcast and take in what Travis has to say. Listen to his message. But we talk about things from scent to you know the the characteristics and the traits we look for in dogs to breeding to uh, you know whether all the things that affect hunting, but it's also in a very unique area of South Texas and there's no place else like it. And, uh, Texas is its own culture. And this was just a very, very good podcast. And, and I normally don't listen to all of the recorded episodes, uh, all the way through, but I found myself Going back, I enjoyed recording this so much. I found myself not being able to uh, listen to it all again, and that's because I've already heard it once. But when you're producing the podcast and you're putting it all together, and and you know, you just you kind of get the flow of it, so you skip through. But I couldn't skip through, and I don't think you will be able to either. So I'm really excited about this this episode of the Houndsman XP podcast, and and don't miss it and so uh, that's all i got to say about that you're going to hear it all uh, but guys like robert miller from michigan who uh, just recently sent me a question robert uses his dogs up there to uh, track deer and recover deer for people you're going to get a lot out of this podcast he sent me a question about scent about scent discrimination about the uniqueness of scent. I think that Travis is going to answer those questions you sent me, Robert. And there's no sense in me going into a big lecture about scent. Travis has got it figured out. So enjoy this. But before we get there, guys, I, I am really stoked. I really, seriously. 2021 has been a year of victory for the houndsman. And I want you to think about this because we talk a lot about the things that we need to do and, and staying vigilant and, and, and it always sounds like the sky's fallen and we've got to celebrate some victories. So Montana house bill 468 passed the Senate and is on its way to the governor's office where it's expected to be signed into law, allowing Montana houndsmen to, to have a spring bear season using hounds and also a summer training season using hounds. That is, is historical for the state of Montana. And a lot of people went into making this thing work from the representatives, uh, Paul Fielder on the house side. And, and then you've got guys like Terry Zink who worked on this bill got a lot of information out there on his social media platform, shared it on the Houndsman XP platform, uh, you know, the podcast group page. Uh, Ross Feenster was out there spending days in Hel Helena, uh, Montana, and, and working with legislators to to get this passed through. You had the, the groups like uh, Hunter Nation and Sportsman's Alliance who were getting the word out. So that that just goes to show you that there is victory. And it's such a sweet victory because I cannot think of the last time that we actually had the use of hounds added to the management plan for hunting. 
We're always getting it taken away, but this time we got it added to the management plan as an approved method for taking black bear in the state of Montana. Other victories we've had. That's not the only one. I mean, Nevada Sporting Dog Alliance put out the cry for help, and and you rallied around that and 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 helped them sustain their black bear season and the use of hounds for that. Uh, there's tethering bills that are being that are being put down and defeated because you're getting getting with it. One thing I'll I'll just bring up though is we can't be asleep at the wheel here, folks. We've got to pay attention. We've got to keep our eye on the ball. And right now in the state of Vermont, Vermont needs our help to keep uh, hound hunting on on the on the radar and and in the approved methods for taking black bear uh legislators uninformed legislators ignorant legislators who have no idea who we are and what we do uh, i've listened to the animal radicals and and have introduced a bill that would take this uh practice of using hounds in the state of vermont off the books and make it illegal to pursue black bears with hounds there so Watch our um, Houndsman XP podcast group page on Facebook. We've got people that are updating uh, that page with information about Vermont. We've already got contact information there. We've got email addresses. We've got all this stuff. So if you're not following us there, find the Houndsman XP podcast group and and request to join the page. Okay, you have to have, and, and make sure that you answer the questions. If, if we're getting to the point now on that page where we've already had to uh, go through and clean house on a few trolls and people that, that were trying to infiltrate our group. So please answer those questions and, and we will approve you to come in and be able to start seeing that stuff. I also want to give a shout out to Lauren. Uh, she has been hammering the, the legislative issues, especially in Wisconsin. And so if you're not following Lauren on uh, her personal page, Lauren Verani, V-R-A-N-Y, you need to follow her there. Also on Instagram, she's posting under uh, Brew City Blues. And she uh, uh, is just knocking it out of the park. She's really involved in, in keeping track of all that stuff. So make sure you're following Houndsman XP Podcast group and also Lauren on her personal pages because she is uh she's she's really doing a good job for especially wisconsin hunters right now so guys like i said i'm i'm stoked i'm not only stoked about about this this season of victory we've had but i'm also really excited about you hearing this podcast you are not going to be disappointed this is not a deer dog podcast or a you know, like I've said before, I don't care if we're we're chasing field mice with our with our hounds. Um, it doesn't really matter. This, uh, Travis is a houndsman, and and you're going to walk away with uh, some real gems after you listen to this podcast. So, guys, that's enough for me. We've got a hot one here, and it's time to dump the box. And where where are we at? Kennedy, Texas. And what restaurant did you say we were at? Jalisco. Uh, <laughs> no, you said something about Ruby's. Ruby's or, Lounge. Oh, Ruby's Lounge, yeah. Fallerton, Texas. Yeah. 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 What is what's Ruby's Lounge? Are we allowed to talk about that on the air? Yeah. Well, it depends if you want to be politically correct or not. Oh, okay. If you're from South Texas, you'll know. Yeah. Ruby's Lounge. Tell them about the bumper sticker. It's the home of Coyotes, Cowboys, Rattlesnakes, and all others. And yep. Mexicans. You can say it. It's okay. Where we're at, Mexicans are proud to be Mexicans. Absolutely. So yeah. You don't call them Hispanic. You don't Mm-mm. call them Latino. You call them Mexicans. Right. That's right. And they're proud. Well, and it's a it, the thing that always impresses me about coming to South Texas, interacting down here, it's just there's really not a whole lot of – it's just part of the culture. You oh, know? absolutely. I mean, I look forward to it. I look forward to it. And, and – mm-hmm. uh, I don't see a problem. Mm-mm. No. So, well, we are in Kennedy, Texas, and we got Shorty Gorm, and uh, uh, is 
helping me co-host this, Shorty. You're you're um, you're the man from South Texas that's hooking us up with contacts here. So you want to in- introduce our guest? Yeah, we're uh, we're here with a friend of mine, Travis Land, um, and Travis is uh, a long time, um, I guess, what third generation hound hunter? Yes, sir. Um, from from down here. Uh, Something that's going to be unique to to our listeners today, most most people haven't heard of. I know when I was telling you, Chris, about it, you were kind of looking at me a little bit cross-eyed. But but uh, you know why would why would we talk to Travis? Um, and uh, Travis is is a guy that has uh, blood tracking dogs for yeah. for game recovery. And, yeah, when and, you told me blood tracking dog, you know, automatically in my world, you know, I was thinking some dude with a muddy adopted from the pound and and uh when you when you really get down to it and i'm this isn't disparaging against eastern deer hunters but it's becoming a fad up in indiana to to have a blood tracking dog and to be quite honest i've recovered my wounded deer on my property with everything from uh, a Chesapeake Bay Retriever to a Mountain Feist to the to the dog that my wife, I just took them up there and just watched them, and uh, they locked in on it, and you just kind of encourage them a little bit, and just let them do their thing, and and you just go with them. But what we're doing here, what Travis is doing, is something completely different than what I. <laughs> so when you told me blood trackers, I was like. Dude, I could have interviewed 20 of them in Indiana, and I was never excited about doing it. But right. when you told me what Travis does, then I'm thinking, okay, this this could work. Yeah, it's, you know, and we'll let you talk about it a little bit more here, Travis. Let's just tell Travis a story for him. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, it, it really is. Uh, I've got to be on, on some recoveries, and, and it's really – the same as the way we hunt game with hounds i mean you know i hunt cats and and what travis is doing is is a lot the same with that the style that that they use and that so yeah and the same um, type of breeding that you know as those dogs those dogs are special to to what what i do down here in south texas yeah and 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 to allude to what you said about it being popular you know where you're from you know there's a lot of game where you're from but there's just so much more of an introduced diversity of of animals in South Texas that these dogs have to navigate through where they're shot. You know, what what game is not in South Texas? That's right. You know, we talked about that a little bit. Yeah, we were trying to think of one. We couldn't. <laughs> yeah, and just exotics, you know, the exotics. Yeah, and sure. And, um, I mean, what were you calling? You talking about a paracoon earlier. Yeah, um, so we have a, a raccoon down here. They call it a paracoon, and it's kind of kind – of you know, it's a raccoon, but it seems to have a little bit shorter tail. But they run like crazy. I wonder if you could like get plus points. You could get plus points for those in a in a competition in night a, hunt, or if I you'd get know. minus. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to call that in and ask them. Yeah, yeah. You you're definitely gonna have to whip out the rule book for that one. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so. Texas is known for having other, everything from. You might be driving down the road and see giraffes or impala or white-tailed deer or Rocky Mountain elk. That's right. You know, it's just, it's all here. That's yep. right. So. And these and these dogs have to navigate, you know, my dogs are not just game-specific dogs. They're, they're, they're blood-specific and animal-specific to what we're, what I put them on, you know, whether it's an axis deer, which is very popular down here to hunt, a black buck, antelope, or even an eland. So when you say... An eland. That's, a, that's one that I wouldn't have thought of, Travis. Yes, sir. When you say blood-specific... Well, let's so, not let's not get too far ahead. I want to talk about how Travis got, <laughs> but I want you to hold that thought. You got it. I'll hold it right here. I'm gonna put it in my pocket. We should have gone over like the show notes that I always store in my head, and expect everybody to know. I don't have any room in my head for more <laughs> notes. <laughs> Travis, how did you how do you get your start in hounds? Because you haven't been a blood tracker. Well. You know, I've always had a, do- a deer dog since I was about 15. I'll be now, honest. was it a deer dog, a traditional? It was more of a traditional cur-type dog that, that, that goes back to, that went back to some other bloodlines here in South Texas. And uh, it was given to me by a hog hunter in, in Dilly, Texas, Denny Dubos. But uh, third generation houndsman, uh, grandfather, first running walker hound in 1949. 
yeah. you know, shortly after he got back from the war. And, uh, you know, they always hunted wolf dogs in this area. They called them wolf dogs. And, and uh, it's been mentioned on some of your other podcasts, the South Texas Wolf Hunters Association was held right down the road from where we're at today in Gillette. And, yeah. uh, you know, I've got some young men. It, it went from my grandfather to my uncle who bred more of a hybrid dog, hybrid hound crosses, cur crosses, you know, with some Florida stock dogs. And uh, he hunted hogs for farmers all over South Texas. Yeah. You know, one of the original hog hunters down here. And I loved it, and I've still got hog dogs to this day. But I, I just always enjoyed the reward of the smile on a hunter's face to find an animal or a, or a young child's first animal. There's We find those, you know, a dozen of those every year. First mm-hmm. deer, first animal. It's just always rewarding to me to be able to train a dog to navigate through everything that we have to do to find a wounded animal in South Texas. It's just real rewarding to me to yeah. be able to do that. And, and it goes back a long way, and, and I'm proud of that. Yeah, and it, it, so it started It started off as, as uh, grandparents doing traditional hound dogger stuff. Right. And then do you still do some – do you still hog hunt or – Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. I still got it. I try to hog hunt too just so I keep that lineage – between myself and another good friend of mine, uh, Bub Allen, mm-hmm. so we, we it's a, it's a it's a pretty tight knit circle that we try to keep these. And just it's no different than anywhere else. You know, if you've got some good dogs, you want to keep them. I want to go down close. that road just real quick. So when you talk about keeping that tight circle of of genetics and stuff that you're breeding for, uh, what do the dogs what do the dogs go back to? Is that a trade secret or is it is it? You know, I, I don't. I'm I'm not re- real well versed in the bloodlines of where these dogs came from. That I, I just know the men that they came from, uh, Cletus Land, and some of these other wolf hunters that are still here with us today: Joe Tyner, John Kuchmere, mm-hmm. uh, Hilmer Cowie, some of our local guys that that have had these dogs and have traded them amongst themselves. What I would consider some of the old well, they are they're the older they're older timer they're old school. Yeah, you know they're some of the original guys that were here or what's left. Mm-hmm. And what was here because it's such a i hate to say this but it's it's we need to promote it more because it's a kind of a dying breed wolf hunters there's not many coyote hunters left in south texas and the ones that are really are in this general area yeah and well, those guys are in their 70s you know mm-hmm. how much time do you spend hog hunting these days we try to go a couple nights a week you know just to keep dogs legged up and you know work and god willing we'll keep doing it yeah yeah that's good stuff that's good stuff all right, Shorty, you've been chomping at the bed. I, I put, I, I you put you me down on hold. I still I have that question in my pocket. All right. Um, so I would have forgot it by now. Yeah. yeah. No. Um, so, and I think what you had mentioned just a minute ago, I think a lot of people, when they think of, of deer dogs or, or recovery dogs, just a dog that runs deer, but you said they're blood specific. So what do you, what do you mean by blood specific? Well, I, I've, I've been able, I've had success training these dogs. I'll try to raise them around as many animals and, and as many exotic ranches. I, I try to haul these dogs with me a lot. Mm-hmm. So they're exposed to, number one, people, because we're around different people all the time. And we all know some of these, how dogs can be. Houndsmen know that. I'd be in trouble. Yeah. There's, <laughs> there's some hounds that just, you're not, there's nobody's going to be able to handle, handle your dog. So, you know, out there in the truck right now, I've got a six-month-old puppy that's just sitting there, you yeah. know, watching people walk by the restaurant. But I try to introduce them to that. I, I'll try to, I've got a lot of good friends who uh, who have big ranches in South Texas, and, and I'm fortunate enough to just take those dogs out and introduce them to game running by them. Mm-hmm. You know, there's South Texas is full of deer. It's full of exotics. Just l- exposing them to all those different scents and smells. And then I'll try to, once they get to be about a year old and it's and it's time to go, I'll, I'll start putting them on deer that are easy to find. You know, mm-hmm. just, just deer that were shot and went 30, 40 yards. Just easy stuff and build confidence, build confidence, just like you'll do with a young hound. And uh, I try not to cast a young dog to older dogs too much because they, they just do more running. Okay, so so that, dog that brings up a question, and I think something we need to describe. You're actually, when you have a dog that's broke and ready, I mean, you can do the complete mm-hmm. truck to recovery with him. Mm-hmm. You're free casting that hound. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, Texas is one of the the last places 
or one of one of the few places that you can actually do that. The world I'm from, you know, the dog has to be on a leash. Correct. So, correct. It, it would be if anybody's ever traveled to South Texas, you could only imagine how hard it would be to leave a dog on a leash and try to navigate this brush. Oh my and, boy, goodness. you'd have thorns pear. everywhere <laughs> and pear. You know, pear pear bushes that can get as high as twenty feet tall in some yeah. some of these places. So. To, to have to be able to be able to navigate and be successful and, and get a successful recovery in South Texas, it, it just it, it's almost impossible to try to leave a dog on a leash yeah. to navigate this type of. I think terrain. I think I think these thistles and stuff down here float through the air and embed themselves in your skin. You can't get away with <laughs> you can't get away from. I <laughs> Shorty last night I was like, "You guys ever get used to the, having this stuff poking you?" And he goes, "You don't ever. What do you say? You don't." So you don't have to like it, but you have to get used to it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> get you a good pair of shops. Man, I'll tell you what. they were. I, I was just standing out there, and all of a sudden I felt one poking me. But a pear bush, to give people that don't understand what that is, that's that flat paddle cactus. Prick, prickly pear cactus. Prickly, yeah, yeah, prickly pear cactus, and it's growing crazy. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then besides that, everything else will stick you Mesquite too. Mesquite mm-hmm. thorns, black brush, rose yeah. hedge. Yeah, yeah it's I can go on. Yeah, yeah. so on. trying to think that you could uh, run through the bush with a, a dog on a on a twenty foot tracking line in a harness, it didn't happen. Not Nothing. happening. They'd be so tangled up. Yeah, you know, they would have had so. to give me a raise and a bonus <laughs> to be a canine handler down here. Yes, sir. <laughs> you know, as, and, as and, law and, enforcement. And and we're not just always we're not always finding deer that are going to be dead uh, mm-hmm. I, I try to and that's where that's where a good houndsman who's a blood trailer has got to do his work in order to help his dog be successful is to interview the public and whoever shot the deer and and really try to gather as much from what they saw and and interview them and and, and kind of did he fall down on his front end and run off did he fall down on his back end and run off did he high kick there's so many different questions that we ask these hunters to try to put together a picture in our mind to, to know number one can we be successful and if it's a marginal that we can or can't we've got to do our part and explain to them look i'm going to come and i'm going to look for this deer but there's a 50 50 chance here that he might still be alive mm-hmm. you know the number one call that that i don't catch is the deer went down in the road he got up and ran off N- nine times out of ten that deer was shot high in a void and it just clipped him he hit the ground, yeah. stunned him for a minute, just like, you know, you getting hit in the chin. Stunned him for a minute, he gets up, he runs off. That's a deer that I could probably get up and, and run, but I might not catch up to him. Yeah, yeah. Because you know, he's not hurt. And, and so I, he's I not, to do my he's job. He's not in anything vital that's going to. That's right. correct. Yeah. That's correct. So I, it, it, a lot of it falls on my, you know, us as, as blood trailers. And going back to the leash, this is what I'm trying to get get to is it just would be so hard to try to figure that out because we catch so many broke yeah. leg deer and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, so you're hunting, you're hunting a, you're free casting your hounds. Yes, sir. The hounds got to be broke off all game, all except game. for blood. Mm-hmm. You're, you're not always finding dead deer, you know. So you're finding some wounded deer. What does it take in a hound for you to make a good deer dog? What do you need out of a hound? You know, I, I get asked that a lot, and Shorty, I think the one thing that that I that people when people ask me what I breed for in a dog like that, I'm breeding for brains. Number one, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. brains, because it it takes. It, you know, it's no secret a lot of Texas is hunting is in high fences. So if we get on a a, a deer or an animal, a wounded animal that is in these bigger high fences that can still run ten or twelve miles, well, they start running big circles going down the same trails and and that dog's running over a scent trail that's been the same animal's been down twice he's going to have to slow down a little bit and and figure out did he did he cut down this in there or did he go uh, run down this this particular cross fence i mean it's they've got to be able to think first smell second and and be you know athletic third yeah in my opinion i've caught a lot of a lot of deer with older unathletic dogs that just could outthink some of the younger ones that were a little more athletically talented. And I yeah. think that's the biggest misconception in hound hunting in general, period, is a dog doesn't have to be physically fast to be fast on a track. 
it's that older slow dog that doesn't ever make a mistake is sometimes faster than that young fast doesn't dog. Doesn't overrun it. It yeah. overruns it, you know, yeah. a few times. It goes back to the old analogy and uh, gunfighting, you know, for mm -hmm. for our military and our law enforcement. Sm slow is smooth, smooth is fast. That's right. You know, and if you it's can. like calf roping. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. Yep, calf roping. You can go out there and be fast. but Slow it, down to be fast. That's what there you go. Is. Yeah. Slow down to be okay, fast. Okay, so I got to get back to this. So you're telling me that you break your dogs off a of deer? Before I train them to find deer. <laughs> That's blood specific. Yeah. <laughs> so you're breaking your – tell us – tell me about that. I don't even know how to ask well, this question. Well, I'll walk you through it. I'll just walk you through it, Chris. What I'll – when I get a dog, what I consider broke off of all game, mm -hmm. I can trot him down the road where there's been corn fed, and then there, there might be some exotics, or it might be solid deer. I'll trot him down the road, and, and any time that, and I'll trot him with an older dog, so the older dog's just trotting, and then if he tries to peel off, I'll let him go out there a little ways and, and smell and check, because even my older dogs at this point, on deer that are wounded say shot in the belly or shot further back than they needed to be they're not putting off they're not dropping much blood it's all scent so even as an older dog they've got to go check some of these they can be going down a trail and they cross a buck that's running the doe well i'll watch that old dog he'll peel off and he'll go check that deer but he'll come back mm -hmm. to where he left off and go and go keep going right so i want them to check those animals but i don't want them to just i don't want to correct them every time they look at look at a deer so if he takes off, peels off, and puts in and gives mouth, I I'm going to correct him and bring him back to the road mm -hmm. until I can get him uh, going down the road without chasing any animal that crosses his path. And then I'll start, uh, Then I'll start. like I said, we'll, we'll start finding easy easy tracks. You know, we'll find a lot of sign, you know, bone chips, broken leg deer, something mm -hmm. that's not going to run very far. And uh, then I'll start to kind of mess with their heads a little bit. Because it's we hunt over feeders in Texas because we can't just like we discussed earlier you're not gonna you're not gonna stalk hunt deer in Texas exactly very easily <laughs> yeah. in, in the pear in the in the in the mesquite so I'll set these dogs up to fail so I can correct them and then take them to an easy track so I'll ninety percent of what I do a lot of times is pull up to a, a feeder where a deer was shot mm -hmm. and those dogs learn that and those old dogs will get out. They'll stretch their legs, and then they'll start making circles while I'm still getting all my GPS and coordinate stuff. And I'll have a deer hunter ask me, well, do you want me to show you, show you the blood? No, sir, he'll find it. You know, and, and, and while I'm getting all my things together, that dog, I look down, and he's already a couple of hundred yards down the trail, and I know he's right. So to get back to training a young dog, I'll, I'll take him to feeders, and I'll let them smell around, smell around, let them go off and track, and I'll correct them if they bounce a, a dry deer, and I know that he's not – correct you I'll call correct. it a dry deer a deer that's not bleeding right okay yep. a deer that's not wounded a dry right. deer so if he bounces a dry deer or tries to run you know something he's not supposed to i'll correct him back mm -hmm. and then i'll take him back over to an easy track so he he starts to associate the difference in this deer's not bleeding this deer's not giving off any type of intestinal scent from being shot mm -hmm. further back there's you know they just correlate it and some of some of them t it, i go through quite a few dogs that's where I was. I, t I told you when we started. I breed for brains mm -hmm. more than I breed for yeah. ability. And so, so the reason you're breaking up, how many how many white-tailed deer will be at one of these feeders on these ranches at one time? Oh gosh, and that's something else. I can show up 24 hours later sometimes and find these animals. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about a feeder that's gone off three times since I've been there, been stepped on by, in Central Texas where there's a huge population of deer. There could be 20 or 30 deer there at those feeders at one time. So you can't have a dog that's just going to go out there and run deer. You need them to run the right deer. That's correct. Yeah. Now it's making sense why you would break your dog off a deer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, all the exotics that are, that are present in, in Central Texas. And that gets even more tough. You know, those two plots I've got in the truck out there, they're the trashiest thing you ever saw. <laughs> <laughs> I would have, I would wear out a, I would wear out an alpha, you know, <laughs> they'd be riding the lightning nonstop. 
riding the lightning. That's, yep. a, good, that's a good term. That's, yeah. yep. they, I'll tell you what, it's a, it's amazing. It's amazing that, you know, what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, so just kind of walk us through from the time you get the call to the recovery. And okay. then I want to talk to you about why you do it after okay. that. Okay. Um, you know, that's uh, we talked about interviewing the hunters. And, 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 and interview is not the proper word. I can just tell you interrogation? that. It's, it's interrogation? It's interrogation. It is. I've, I've had the call, make that call, and they will ask you. I mean, you are literally interrogated. And people get frustrated sometimes, but it, it, tells, us, it, it tells us so much mm-hmm. by asking the right questions. We ask caliber. We ask, you know, what time of day. We ask how far. And, and all these questions, and I've learned the right questions to ask by emulating some of the, the older men that took, I was fortunate enough to go along with here in south texas i mean there's there's several great older men that have been doing this for years down here um you know just just to mention a few and i've got to because i i have the greatest respect for them wade cornelius roy hines and robbie hurt three four of the original men down here with with great uh great deer tracking dogs and i was fortunate enough to get to ride with a few of them and, and visit with them and pick each other's brains just like houndsmen do mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh so going back to that interview process, you've got to ask so many questions because the general public sometimes doesn't know why the deer did this or why it did that. Did he run off with the leg up? Did he did he go down on his back end first before he got up and ran off? That 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 tells me he may be hit in the back leg. Mm-hmm. You know, and and it's not that people are terrible shots, but there's that's a big old deer, you know, and and, and people get nervous and it's first animals for a lot of people and. Things just happen. The blind move. The guide kicked the side of the blind. You know, a lot of people tease me. Say, how much did you give that guide to kick that blind right before he shot that deer? You know, yeah. but you know that's that's not a lot different. I, and I understand exactly what you're saying. After 30 years in law enforcement, you know, when there's a sensational event, mm-hmm. people pick. Very few people pick up on the detail part yep. of something for a traumatic or a, a sensational event Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know they just remember the high points that come to mind to them right the more questions you ask you have to peel back the layers of that onion to find out what really happened and that's so you got to be part you've got to be part investigator here that's the first thing you got interrogator yes sir yeah good deal yes sir and and that just tells me so much and and how long ago they shot it too because sometimes and, and that's just what people do naturally that don't know any better they'll they'll shoot an animal that that might not be shot marginally They'll, they'll they'll walk down there and they won't see any sign. They'll go back to camp, okay? Then they'll eat breakfast and they'll talk about it. And somebody will, oh, I'll help you go find it. Well, they go out there and then, and then there's four or five of them out there stomping on your scent. Right. You know, and they find it and they'll push him. If he's a, if he's a broke-legged deer or an animal or he's shot further back, that deer's still got plenty of gas and plenty mobile. And they said, well, we trailed, we trailed blood. We had blood for 800,000 yards. Well, yeah, you did. You know, you did because that deer kept hearing you or kept smelling you. He just kept moving mm-hmm. far enough away from you mm-hmm. where you couldn't see him. And, uh, you know, that's another thing that these dogs have to navigate. Not only scent from other animals, you've got four or five other deer hunters trying to help. Not not cause it, not want to cause harm, but they're out there. They're, they're wiping on their blood. They're wiping blood on their pants. They're stepping on sign that your dog right. could use. Or they've got a couple of dead deer in the back of the truck that are dripping in the road, you know, oh, loaded man. in the back of the truck. I know truck. exactly what you're saying. So mm-hmm. they drove off. They drove over there to help him find the deer. They've got a deer in the back of their truck. This has happened. They drive back out to the main road and go all the way back to the lodge. <clears throat> so, we'll, ju- we'll just drive around and see if we can maybe see him. Yeah, and they've got another deer in the back of their truck that's bleeding through the tailgate. Oh, <laughs> so man. my dog's going down, the, going down the main road. But he's figured that stuff out. Yeah, and a lot of times when those guys make those long trails in there, I'll ask them which way did you walk out, because I've watched that dog on my alpha trail all the way back to where the main road is, come back down us in there to me and start over again, and I'll ask them which way they walked out, and they said, well, we went to this road over here because it was closer. Well, that's the way the dog went. So, I've got to interpret on my alpha too on these really really tough tracks how to help my dog be successful and watch him watch his trail, and. You have to learn so much. I've learned so much from watching these alphas. I don't know how some of these older men did it in the, in the day because we can make a dog and understand and interpret what that dog's trying to tell us by watching where he's mm-hmm. been. Not where he, This dog doesn't cast. Okay, so just to verify that, so you're watching on your alpha. That dog is or is not 
opening while he's doing all this. He is not. Unless he gets very, very aggravated. You know, my, my dog is, is half hound. Mm -hmm. You know, he's I, I kind of like a half of a hound because here in South Texas, it, it, it just seems to help that hybrid vigor that that cross there mm -hmm. he gives you a little bit more of a of a grit and it gives you a little it, and you get the stamina from the from the hound side right when i get the handle handle of the, the of, cur. of the cur mm -hmm. so he, the hound will come out every once in a while on a real tough track because i can tell he gets mad and his that tail's moving and he'll hit a scent and he'll boop and i can go right there and i mark it on my alpha and i'll go over there and there'll be one little old speck of blood smaller than your pinky nail, mm -hmm. you know, and and that, that and I'll mark that and I'll just kind of try to help him along, and he'll he's he's so specific and he's so careful, he makes circles and if he gets too far one direction he's gonna come back to where he knows he knows where that speck of blood is I don't don't tell me how instinct but he comes back to there starts over, and goes again, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just amazing, the things that they're able to do down here. So you mentioned mentioned uh, half hound half cur. Mm -hmm. Are there any specific breeds that you've had um, the most success with, or are you you just breeding on your own stock? We're, I'm, I, I can't say my own stock. I can say that it went back to my uncle's mm -hmm. hog dog stock and my family's hound line from all the way back to 1948. So, so the walkers that your grandpa had? Yes, sir. And the cur dogs that your uncle had? Yes, sir. And And later, towards the end of his life, I lost my uncle about four or five years ago. Towards the end of his life, he kind of – he got older. He, the hog dog deal got a little tougher. He went back to running wolves, you know, with, with Walker. So, I was fortunate enough to be able to pull from those two pools. Yeah. Was it a black mouth cur? Or? No, they're just a red red stock dog, just a red South Texas cur dog that, that like I said, went back to probably nineteen early 1970s when he got that. Yeah. Those red dogs out of Florida. Yeah, I was just curious. I, I, that's kind of a sidetrack. No, they, they we're, were red, talking about. He always called. He always called them Florida working dogs. Okay. You know, red, red Florida working dogs is where they kind of yeah. where he started his hog dog pack out of. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, so you get the call. You're out there. You found some sign. Some sign. Yes, sir. You've already done your interrogation. Mm-hmm. You know what? You're you're kind. You you've got pieces of the puzzle. Correct. So now we're ready to cast. Right. So do you just drop the tailgate and let the dog do the work, or do you try to find some sign? Well, or? what I've th – there's a lot of people that, that like to walk walk along, and, and I'm guilty of it as well, and I'll still do it with a younger dog. I want to assure myself that my dog is right, mm -hmm. you know, because in South Texas during a the rut, these, these, these bucks are fighting. You know, there could be one that's, you know, got a split – you know, six or seven inches in his neck, he might be leaving sign from that feeder. Right. I want to see blood. I want to see some sign. Sometimes I will. If it's a tough track, I'll I'll follow along and try to help him. Like I like I told you with the alpha, mm -hmm. and I'll stay on that spot of blood till he shows me he's keep he keeps moving. But I'd say seventy percent of the time I'm staying at the feeder with the hunters, just watching on the the Garmin, letting him do his thing, mm -hmm. go find the deer, get bait, or show treat on the on the alpha if he shows treed the animals dead and everybody's happy um you know when these deer get up and these broke-legged deer get up and start moving we we try to do our best to get in front of them cut them off mm -hmm. you know a lot of times they'll go to tanks when they're wounded uh not and a, so and much a tank a tank down here is a is a <laughs> pool of water it's a pool of water you yeah. know anywhere from 100 acres to, to 30 acres right you know uh, or, or the size of this building you know just they just try to go to water to get away from that dog after, after forty five minutes or an hour race. Mm -hmm. You know they'll they'll try to get away. A lot of people, that's a misconception. They're going to go to the water because he's he's got fever. No, he's going to go to the water to get. He's hot. That dog's got him hot. He's going to exactly. try to get shed of him. Yeah, in that water. So, uh, your dog, your you you get the indication, or you you can hear him bayed, or you see it on your garment mm -hmm. that he's freed. Um, are they catching the deer? Will they, not, will they stop a deer like a hog dog? He will. If a deer is running away from him, yes, he will reach up and, and spin him around. Okay. And he's actually getting a little. He's, he made me nervous this year. We had a close call with one. He got he got hooked a little bit this year. But um, yes, he will stop a deer and then sit back and bay. They're not going to necessarily. They're not going to reach up there and grab a deer like a hog dog. I, okay. I don't. I don't want that because it, it's too much. That was going to be my next question. Well, there's there's a lot of sharp 
items on top of that buck's head. You know, you take yeah. a big old South Texas, you know, 15-point yeah. buck, he can do some damage on a dog sure. real quick. Well, and, and I can only imagine, you know, if, if, if uh, you walk in there and your dog's caught this trophy deer that's anywhere from five to twenty thousand dollars that this guy paid for and he's shredding the ears on it that wouldn't that probably wouldn't go over real well no sir it's not like, at uh, all. i don't think we'll call travis again nine nine times out of ten they're either licking that spot where the blood was or they're chewing on chewing on the back end of him you know mm-hmm. they're they're going to be licking or chewing on where that deer was wounded where that open wound was yeah yeah yes sir but if the deer's gonna run away from, away from him he's gonna reach up there and grab him and spin him around mm-hmm. and, and make him fight but he gives him enough room I've got to be real careful now because I actually bred to one of Shorty's dogs, and I've got he, he's a little he's just like his daddy. He's pretty rough, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm probably not going to work those two dogs together anymore because that's how I got the my one hurt. Mm-hmm. And a deer will stay longer with a one dog than he will with two because they're not putting so much heat on him. When you say when you say rough, you you're talking about rough on game. Rough on game. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Getting getting in too tight, getting in too close, getting to spin him. They'll, they've got to where this year they were spinning them real. One was on one side, one was on another, and they just had him spinning, spinning, spinning. Well, it doesn't take much to get a dog up against a pear bush and run through him, mm-hmm. and that's how we got in the bind this year. So I, it just it's when I get in those long races, I'll cast a second dog to try to shorten the race mm-hmm. because we're getting five or six calls a day. You know, so I want I want to be able to kind of alternate these two dogs so I can help other hunters be successful. And we're talking five or six calls a day on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the busiest days of the of the week. Are hopefully. you kidding me? Yes, five sir. or six calls mm-hmm. a yes, day. Sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, that some of these is... guys are teaming up. You know, to uh, well, like I know Robbie, he his brother and his wife go with him mm-hmm. so that he can sleep between calls because they have so many calls on the weekends. You know. So how many times have you gotten out there? The guys like, oh, I hit him good. I hit him good. I hit. Uh, I just can't believe he got away. He was standing right over there. And then as you start looking around, you find out that he wasn't standing over there. He was standing hundred yards, hundred yards further and off to the left. And you know how many times you run into that? All the time, all the time, Chris. And, and it's and it's not their fault. They got excited, you know, and and. and it's 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 just like you said, like you alluded to earlier. You know that that excited moment. It, it doesn't. You know there he is. There's a deer that he's been looking at on camera. He's been trying to hunt him for thirty, thirty or forty sets. He there he is, and let me grab my gun and throw it up and pull a shot. You know, and that just happens. That's just sure. human nature. It's natural. That's, so that's why the interrogation. That's exactly. why because you want to eliminate that as much as you possibly can. Mm-hmm. Eliminate as many unknowns and set your dog up for success Correct. as much as you can. And not so much that. And, and to go back to getting five or six calls a day, the timing of some of these calls. Because mm-hmm. I can tell from those interrogations that that deer's hit a little further back. Let's give him a little time. I'll go I'll go try to find these two men's deer first. Mm-hmm. That I, that maybe one shot him the evening before. That happens a lot. They'll, they'll shoot him in the evenings. They won't call us till the next day. You know, the middle of the day, because they looked that night, couldn't find him. Well, we'll go back and try in the daylight. That didn't work, so now let's call the dog. So, I'll try to space those calls out in order to help. This well. sounds exactly like being a law enforcement canine handler, and I was <laughs> one for several years. But it, it, even even law enforcement, even after you put them through training, and you say, you get somebody that runs from you, your first call should be have canine in route. Mm-hmm. You know, and then set up your perimeter and contain. That's that's your job. But more times than not, I'd get that call at 3 o'clock in the morning from dispatch, from, from wherever, and they'd tell me, they'd be like, we had a guy run about 10 o'clock, and the guys have been out looking for him. They can't find him. Can you bring your dog and find him? <laughs> and do the same thing that you're mm-hmm. talking about, Travis. Interrogation. I'm And now I'm interrogating policemen. It's like okay, where was he? Because their adrenaline's pumping and all this stuff. Sure. And I've I've seen all of this stuff. I mean, it's amazing the parallels mm-hmm. in those two things. Um, I mean, it's yeah. blowing me yeah. away. No, it, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. It and, really uh, is. So, one thing you you said a minute ago, turn the second dog loose. How? Uh, so when you're doing this, are you running a pack of hounds? Uh, typically, one hound. How many hounds are you allowed to? to run or is there a limit or there is there is a limit and i was actually involved in a little bit of it um 
about 2000, I'd say two, in, in the year 2002, three, four, somewhere right in there. Uh, I was younger at the time and, and I was, I was, I wasn't involved as heavily as some of the men in South Texas were the originals, Wade, Wade, Roy, Robbie and Wade Ruddock that, there was a there was a citation issued for running deer with hounds in South Texas, mm-hmm. and we had to get we had to bring a bring a lot of light to what was going on in South Texas and why we were using them, how many we were using, and why. And originally nobody ever used more than two down here anyway, but the state only allows you to use two dogs on the ground at any time to recover a wounded deer, wound, wounded whitetail, okay, in Texas. So there are some there's a few counties up in the northeast texas that still only allow leashed Mm -hmm. and some didn't allow it at all just because those were some of the counties as we talked earlier some of the counties that were still running deer with dogs with pack of hounds okay so i'm only allowed to use two dogs legally on the ground at once Let, let me get let me get this straight so is it legal to is there any place left in texas where it's illegal to hunt deer with the use of hounds not that I'm aware of. No, okay, sir. so so that's off the table. Mm-hmm. That's completely off. All right, all right. That that was one of the things I was curious about. If Texas is still a state that allows hunting with hounds? Correct. No, that I don't. I don't believe that there's any. There are any counties left. Okay. You know, and, and there were some counties that wouldn't even allow tracking up until recently, with with hounds, just because of that. You know, and those were some of those older counties where that still existed. Mm-hmm. So, but yes, two two hounds on the, no more than two at any time on on one specific deer and and you just try to i try to navigate through what i'm told by the hunter and and what's being put in front of me is this deer do i think this deer's busted leg is he shot high and just has a little chunk of meat out of his out of his neck and i'm not going to stop him or if we see him cross the road and he's got all four legs and and we can maybe see where he was wounded i'll i'll, I'll stop it i'll stop Mm-hmm. I mean, if I get a visual on that deer and I don't think we can catch up to him and the dog's behind him, you know, uh, a half a mile sometimes when it gets hot down here in December. Yeah. You know, we have 85-degree days in December down here. So just got to be real careful about how we navigate these calls and sure. and try to be successful as we can. How much How much do you have to pay attention to weather? How much does weather affect your tracking ability and stuff down here? I tell you, it, it it's always dry down here. Everybody knows in South Texas. It's it's just we've been a desert here for about the past three or four years, even worse than normal. But uh, you know, during the winter months, sometimes we we've got some we got those old winter, you know, misty days, cloudy mm-hmm. days. The hardest day for me to track in South Texas is a day a bright blue sky day after a northern. And there's a lot of houndsmen there. After their after head. a what? After after a northern down yeah. here in South Texas. There's yeah. we've got those high blue skies, and I always dread it. You know, because I, I, my success rate, it goes down on those high blue sky days mm-hmm. after the day or two after a, a good hard northern. But here's here's the other parallel. So if you were just a houndsman, you would pick the best days to go hunting. But the other parallel to what you were doing, canine ham, you go when you get the call. Yeah, you don't get so to you choose don't, your we day. Don't have, exactly. We don't get to choose. So do you do – you, uh, talk about that high school – what do you think is going on with the scent there? Because we've, we've talked about – We've had a whole podcast on scent and scenting and oh, okay. how dogs' nose works, and and we're going to build on that. But this could be a part of that. Um, you know, we're taking a dog that is tracking microscopic. I mean, they can track that the 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 molecules of that bile coming Correct. out of it, or the the blood spore, right. um, and putting this thing together for what what we call a scent picture. You know, to track that specific deer. That that deer, even though he's a deer, he has a specific smell. Smell. A and spe- I believe I believe that's that dog has a good dog has figured that out. And and then you add the blood spore or the, the intestinal fluids or whatever it is with that. Now he knows that's how amazing a dog's nose is. They know that this is the deer I need to track and I've put it together with the, the leakage, mm-hmm. whatever that is. Right. And now they're they're going out there. So so the question is, um, what do you think's going on there on those blue sky days? You know, you take those those dry blue northerns that blow through down here, and they've already they've blown scent everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we're already under dry conditions. Then you give us dry skies and and no clouds. There's just there's nothing holding that scent down anymore. Is is 
is the best way I could put it. There's nothing. There's do you no track it? Do there's you no. track it with your apps on your phone or meteor meteorology or? I have not. I, I don't. Barometric I, I pressures. I don't follow barometric pressure. I know these guys do. Mm -hmm. I mean, the cat the cat guys down here and the wolf guys down here definitely do, mm -hmm. and they pick those better days. And, and and but it's 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 no secret. And 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 I make I make the public aware. Look, we just had a northern. There's no clouds in the skies. There's no moisture in the ground. This is going to be tough on us. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you pre pre capture attempt, you kind of already let them know. And I've always said that because when you go into a hunt and you're taking the public or hunting for the public, and it's happening, and they're saying, "What's happening?" And then you're going, "Well, it's dry down here. We just had northern." You're making an excuse right. in their eyes. You exactly. Know, if you if you Yes. Go into it. Well, this guy's dog's no good. He, he, you right. know, I right. may not know some of these guys. A lot of exactly. them I do know, and a lot of them will trust you. But sure. if this is a new call or, or a new ranch that I've, I've been fortunate enough to call me, it's I try to lay everything out there on the line. Because you're not going to last in this business very long if you're not, number one, honest. Because South Texas is a small area. South and Central Texas is pretty small at the top, you know, mm -hmm. for these bigger places that you're going to go find a lot of these deer. And, and it doesn't take long to, you know, social media only gets you so far saying you've got a got a dog he's going to have to back it up right yeah so so when you're talking barometric pressure high pressure moves to low pressure and then once that high moves through then you're looking at a low pressure thing and there's nothing pushing that scent down to the yes, ground sir. so now now you've just got it everywhere have you ever have you ever studied anything on scent or the theories of scent or, I or anything like that? I really haven't. Just but it's amazing. The re I'm not. I'm not asking no, you that sir. to put you on the spot. It's amazing that you're figuring this out from experience of right. of how these things work. You know, for me, you know, I've been a houndsman for 38 years, and I I when I've told this story before, but relaying it to you, um, I saw things hounds do things before I ever became a canine handler and during 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 that training you you train on scent and you go to seminars and you read the science and you you have tests on it and you do all this stuff so i was seeing all these things in my hounds for a number of years and trying to put pieces of the puzzle together and then when i went to training then stuff started clicking oh that's why that happened right <clears throat> so when i meet a guy like you it makes me feel like a dummy you know it really <laughs> does because you figured this out just by being out there and knowing you don't know all the scientific terms maybe or, or all that but correct just from being boots on the ground and hours out there i mean that's what being a houndsman is all about mm -hmm. right there and i think it's i think it's just amazing that uh that houndsmen pick that up let your hounds tell you what's going on yeah you know yeah and you, you yeah do you log do you log your I try to uh, as much as I can on those four and five call days. Sometimes stuff gets, you know, it gets hectic. I get tired, you know. Right. Um, but uh, this year, by far, is my biggest year uh, catching deer, uh, 65, 65 recovered animals. Mm -hmm. You know, I probably, that's probably, I haven't looked in the book, but I'm going to guess 80% recovery, you know, and, and that has to do with, the interrogation as well sure there's a lot of these people that, that I, I just it breaks their heart you know i want you to come i want you to come i can't find that deer i'm telling you from what you're telling me i'm not going to catch him you know and and more often than not they're going to call somebody else and and, and then and they might find him but most of the time they're not because i've just been trained to ask so many of the right questions well and and so oftentimes to a young guy like travis um he's not getting the cream of the crop calls He's getting That's the correct. calls after they've already called one of those other guys, and that guy decides, no, I'm not going to come. Well, the hunter says, I don't care. Get a hound here. Right. Well, this, you know, mm -hmm. this guy's not going to come, so they call Travis, and Travis tells him, I'm probably not going to catch. I don't care. Bring your dogs. I want to try. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you got a guy that's just paid $15,000 for a deer. He's got blood. He's, he's going to pay for the deer. That's the ranch. Most of these ranches, if there's blood, you pay for the deer. Right. And so this guy's already into it, 15000 He's going to pay Travis to come try regardless. And yeah. so that's, you know, probably why you're at 80% versus 90-something percent is some of those calls are 
or Mission you know, Impossible. Mission Impossible. Correct. Yeah. 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 Correct. And there's and, and where I'll go to four or five a day. Some of these men have been doing it for ages that I mentioned earlier. That where I'll find sixty this year, the best year I've ever had. Normally I'll find anywhere from twenty five to forty. Best year I've ever had this year. Uh, I'll, I'll probably attribute a little bit of that to COVID because I think when their people were told to work from home, they were working from the deer blind in Texas. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, those guys will go to seven or eight, you know, they'll find a hundred deer a year. Right. You know, and, and, and it's getting a little bit more diluted because the sports, it's 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 almost turning into a sport. There's a, everybody who's got a, every ranch manager, it seems that comes out of Kingsville that wildlife department always they always end up with a dog in the truck you know right. that'll find wounded deer and there's some younger men that that they're, well there's one down there in Encinal he's a younger man a good young man he's got a couple of plots that he's he's been able to train and do well there you go trash your hookup so, hey, right there you'll there have you trash go. problems yeah no. <laughs> <laughs> he'll be out there molesting all the exotic <laughs> and running kudu who knows what but uh, he he's he's had some success at it it's it's just it's got to be in your heart and want to do it and, and be good at it not just to be kind of good at it. It, it down here you know you're going to have to you're going to have to back up what you say yeah or you won't get very many more after that right now, obviously obviously you're you're getting compensated for your work out there and there's nothing wrong with that at all yes sir but but what intrinsic values do you get out of doing this that's kind of what hooked me on it you know i started i started with hog dogs and i love to watch i love that i was a young man ready to go rip and roar and full of testosterone ready to go catch a bunch of hogs and kill them all and i started that but when i saw my first deer dog work i was with wade cornelius when i was about 15 years old and uh just to see it was a young lady first deer first big deer uh we were able to recover that deer not that not that catching hogs doesn't mean something to me as mm-hmm. a houndsman it does but it means it almost means more when i find these wounded animals because to me it's it's from what we've talked about in the past 45 minutes it's it's so much harder and it takes such a special type of dog to do this it's just so much more rewarding to me yeah in my heart i find so many kids first wounded you know first deer I mm-hmm. find so many, you know, young. It, it, it not. It's not always just kids. There's a lot more people getting brought into the, the sport of hunting, and I'm I'm proud of that, and I hope we keep going with that. Yeah, you get a dad that that wants to give his his son a graduation present, and he brings him down at, to a the most epic, memorable hunt that he could find mm-hmm. for him to do, mm-hmm. and and you're helping. By the time Put I the get there, this kid, this kid is in the dumps. Yeah, yeah. emotional. Yeah, okay. yeah. Emotional emotionally, wreck. when I get here, yeah, I, and that's happened a lot. I graduate. That it's funny you mentioned that specific scenario. Mm-hmm. I get there, this kid's 18 years old, he's about to go to college. His daddy bought him an early graduation present. We're going to go to South Texas. We're going to kill you, a big South Texas deer. Well, by the time I get there, I mean his head is in the dirt. Yeah, you know, no hope. No, I mean we've already looked, and everybody's looked, and. We looked last night. We looked this morning. Nobody in camp. We tromped it all up and did yeah. our best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. yeah. There's been 40, 50 more deer walk over it, you know. You're his last hope. I'm his only hope, and it's it's hero or zero for me. You know, it's it's in it, a lot of times bow hunting has become such a sport. Everybody, it's it. I've watched bow hunting in my time. I feel like an old guy because over the past 10 or 12 years, you've watched the bow hunting sport just – tremendously grow yeah and and that 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 attributes a lot too because you know the bow hunting is harder you got to make the good shots and a lot of times those those bow hunters are first time big bow hunting deer and first time deer and if you whenever we are successful it's just so rewarding to me to be able to put all that together watch the dog work and put a smile on people's faces it's probably not a smile i mean you're talking about a kid who's in the dumps and all of a sudden He's got the bone in his hands, and he's doing his grip and grin. You know, that didn't it's, sound good. And that did just, not sound huh? good. That did not sound good <laughs> at all. Hardware. It's hardware. Hardware. <laughs> a deer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what about bone collector? There you go. Oh, we, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He got, he got Think that, about what you this just is, said. Got all that I'm ammo. worried about where your mind is. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm only human. <laughs> I've said so many that. things. I've said so many things on this podcast. I go back and I listen to it, and I'm like, Whoops! Wow, <laughs> that did that didn't come out the way I meant it to come out. No, it's all. Good. <laughs> but, but to be able to put those smiles on on those people's faces, uh, it's just truly rewarding. It makes me proud, even more proud of the the dog that I've had at this time. Mm-hmm. I mean, this 
this dog I have now, River, he's 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 one of a kind. He's special, and I hope I could breed more like him. Uh, I don't know if I ever will. Okay, so here's a question. Uh, you show up to a ranch. You've been on this ranch several times. Maybe you know same same hunter, or whatever. When you show up, do they do they say hi, Travis, or do they say hi, River? That most of the time, if we've been there, they, they go to the back of the truck before they come shake my hand. Yeah. You know? I, I, I hope you brought River. <laughs> yes yeah, sir yes yeah, yeah. sir and they become accustomed to that so if i've got it if it's an easy call and i've got a, a younger dog in the truck that i want i want to find this deer they're like why aren't you putting him on the ground you know he, he's your ace yeah well if we need him we'll use him you right know? Well, he's there for backup right now and he's not that old he's only five so hopefully got some really good he's coming five this summer so if i can keep him backed off and hunt him by himself and we don't get in trouble We'll be, we'll so be I want to get back. I know we don't have too terribly much more time, but um, I want to get back into the hunt. Okay, uh, you got the deer. Let's say, let's say the dog, you know, uh, has the deer bayed. What uh, you know, obviously, if the deer's already deceased, it's it's an easy walk up, get the picture with the, High five, with the kids. Go on. If they if they've got the deer bayed, what's take us through that? What's it like? Because somebody's got to now dispatch the deer. Right. Correct. That, it, that dog is so valuable to me. I, I don't let anybody, it, it, unless we're on a huge high fence ranch and, and the deer is, I don't believe the deer is going to go anywhere. I can call that dog to me and let the hunter finish him off with a bow if this is going to be a book type situation. Mm -hmm. You know, if he, <coughs> he was wounded with a bow and he's a 180 inch typical deer and he's going to go in the book as a bow. I'm a, I can, that older dog, I can call him to me for a second, and I can allow that hunter to kill that deer with his bow. Um, but nine times, that, that's a very, very rare situation. Mm -hmm. Nine times out of the ten, they can't keep up with me in the brush just because I'm so used to getting through it, and I know how to get Damn, through it. Damn, you don't look that fast. Well, I, I, I've, got, I've gained a little bit shorty. I don't <laughs> fight bulls on the weekend <laughs> like you do. I've got a good wife who's a good cook. <laughs> good job round is a shape son <laughs> but even though even though i got short legs a little wide i can get through it pretty good and and uh it's hard you know it's then people aren't dressed for it you know it, it's i love sick gear it's good camo but you're not going to run through pear, mm. pear and thorns with it guarantee it you know it'll rip guarantee your shred. It. so i've got brush jackets and i've got leggings and i'm mm -hmm. ready to get to those to those animals and I, I I know how rough some of these old, mature South Texas bucks can be. They're going to fight. They fought all their life to get that old, eight or nine years old. And, and it's hard for that dog to hold them if they're only, you know, say they've got an elbow, just clipped elbow, and they've still got use of that, that leg. Mm -hmm. You know, they may die. They're going to die eventually from, you know, something. It's going to get them. Coyotes are going to drag them, pull them down or something. But they've still got, that's almost like catching a live deer, mm -hmm. almost. <clears throat> but it's not. And... So you've got to really – River, he makes big circles around these deer. So I've almost got the time or I've got to call him off to the side or get his attention on me for a second so I can kill that deer because that deer you, is just spinning. Mm -hmm. he's, he's on his back legs and he's spinning nine times out of the ten. You know, just he's watching fighting, the dog. Watching the dog. He's yeah. watching the dog and, and, and nine, nine times out of ten, I've got to – not nine times out of ten, all the time, I've got to make an approach downwind. Because some of these deer are so wild down here that they get one cent of you. That the heck with that dog, especially yeah. on an hour, hour and a half long race. Mm -hmm. We finally got him stopped. That deer still got a lot of wind. He sees me or smells me. I'm going to create a longer race. We might not catch him again. And that's happened. Yeah. You know, that just comes from experience. And uh, so I've got to get in there and I've got to get him dispatched as quickly as I can without injuring the dog too. So what do you think? Um, what do you think the 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 narrative is here for people there's so much there's so much talk and about the relationship between deer hunters and houndsmen uh turkey hunters and houndsmen you know, you're doing a service you're bridging that gap between the deer hunting community and the hound hunting community mm -hmm. and i think it's i think it's such such a deal that we need to showcase that you know there if you take hound hunting and, it, and the, the reason i bring this up is because hound hunting is always the lowest hanging fruit you know Correct. and it seems like deer hunters would be more than happy to 
never they don't care whether there's hound hunting or not because they don't see the importance of as a management tool for our game but also exactly can you imagine what would happen in 30 years if there were no more houndsmen that couldn't do what you do what would they do then the, the, the nothing the, those, those, that game would go to waste yeah you're not you're not going to just call some some guy with a dog you know so and so has a dog that used to be legal to 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 hunt with maybe he can find it you know mm-hmm. you, you can't just or jump I got off a the lab i got a labrador i got a duck dog back at the camp that yeah that, that I, I run into that all the time well we tried the duck dog but he couldn't find it so right we called you too so there's just so many things that get thrown at us that we can navigate through but no it's like you said it's Coming from the hog hunting side, well, when 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 deer season starts, you can forget about running a hog dog in Texas. Yeah, right. Because you're not going to stir up these deer. There's so much. There's so much time and effort and feed mm-hmm. and and time. Unless, you, unless you've got some good ranches that like understand. I, that that right. understand exactly. That and and have takes. been with you. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, uh, hounds are automatically associated with. Well, no, they're going to chase my deer. They're going right. to chase right. my cows. Or, or you know that the people that don't understand hounds and houndsmen and what we're trying to do think that they're just going to stir up the whole countryside right well i've had i've had live deer walk up to that dog in the middle of trailing one you know i've had bucks in the rut run right by him you know he's broke and and it's hard to make somebody who's not a houndsman or a dog man understand yeah that that dog is they can't believe it and no but the, the thing is as a hunting community you know, what I hope that we can get out of this podcast of talking to you is showing the value not only to manage hogs on a lease or, or uh, raccoons that are getting in feeders or coyotes. coyotes, whatever that is. But if we, you can't just jump off the couch and go do this. You know, you've got to be a houndsman. You've got to have the skills. You've got to have the breeding and genetics in your dogs. You've got to have the opportunity to work those hounds. And if and if deer hunters don't recognize that and start supporting houndsmen, it's going to go away. And then what are they going to do? Right. You know? That's correct. And that's, you know, that's go back to the social media. I think that's one of the great things about social media is, is you know, you can get on some deer sites and there are actually guys talking about blood trackers and who yeah. you know who to call if you if you need somebody so they are the light is being shed on mm-hmm. on the value of of blood tracking dogs and 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 that just because of social media and and people applying it to to what they're doing and and, and uh so it is it is i think you know as much as social media is a pain in the rear it's a double-edged it, sword it is it yeah. is it yeah. is it really is and in, and that's where the public who doesn't understand that sometimes they need to do their homework as well sure and and, yeah. and do their interrogation of who they're hiring to come find their dude. right so so let me ask you this how many other states do you know of since you're in the business and the network how many other states would allow um what you're doing free casting a hound to recover a deer louisiana is the only one that i'm aware of that, mm-hmm. that you can do that oklahoma i know that you can't uh i'm pretty certain in new mexico you cannot so no. my surrounding areas uh Wouldn't, louisiana do you think would it'd be, be do you think it'd be legal in states that have deer hunting with hounds anyway i would assume so i would think you, would you think, know yeah. georgia florida uh North and South Carolina, Virginia. Yes, sir. You know the uh, south, southeastern states. Mm-hmm. I would assume so. <clears throat> yeah, but it's it's like you, you know, that leash deal is just it's just not for us down here. We just and and, and luckily we've had we've had the right people in the right positions within our parks and wildlife mm-hmm. that, that understand the value. Well, you got a lot of people that are big landowners that yes, that benefit from your services. Yes, sir. And that puts the pressure on from other directions from fish yes, you know for mm-hmm. parks and wildlife <laughs> that's correct you know it really is yep. it's, a, it's a political thing yeah and I, you really know is. i think hunting in in the state of texas is like a two billion dollar industry or something like yes. that it's it's big big time mm-hmm. and all these ranches and stuff you know you talked about it being a small community uh, it's huge you know just the vastness of texas is huge but when you break it down to actual landowners that's a small community. Absolutely, and those so. are the men, and those actually are the men who got involved mm-hmm. uh, in in the in the early two thousands and helped guys like Wade and Roy and Robbie and those who were my age at the time put all that together in order to keep preserve what we 
what we had. It was, you know, folks like several of the other big landowners in Texas that were yeah. able to, to see that through. Yeah. To help us get a voice. Right. That's that, awesome. That's great stuff. Shorty, you got anything else? No, I think we uh, we pretty much covered it. Yeah. You got anything else you want to add? No, Any- sir. I, I appreciate you shedding some light on what we're doing down here with, with some of these deer dogs. And, and I think there's a lot of people that will probably be amazed at that that we go track without a leash and, and how we get it done. And right. If they saw it with their own eyes, they'd probably be even more amazed. You know, and I think that's why you're seeing more and more folks with a deer tracking dog. And it, it's it's kind of growing, mm-hmm. you know. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think it's a great thing if, if people are in it for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. If you're in it for the right reasons, if you're not just out there trying to charge somebody to go find a deer and go on to the next one, that you're not going to last very long in it. You know, you, you can't just kick a dog out and go, oh, I don't think you can catch I don't think this deer's wounded. He'll be back. Because mm-hmm. a lot of times those deer that I go look for and we can't find, we'll come back. They'll see them on camera. You know, deer that I told them we couldn't catch, you know, they'll right. get them on camera. I told you so. Months, <laughs> months later. Yeah, months you later, know. you know. Yeah. So, no, I think it's great. That, that, that there's more opportunities out there for people because f- five or six guys in South Texas who have been doing it for years can't get to all the deer. Yeah. So if there's there's a if there's a ranch hand that's got a dog that, that that might be able to find it then you know or help somebody it's it's a good thing. I agree, and I think you know just to wrap it up, my final thoughts on it. You know, for one thing, I was very ignorant about what deer tracking, mm-hmm. what you do, and. Uh, um, you know, we talked about it. Shorty told me, and I was like, eh, you know, deer, you know, recovery. And, and then after I started, he started telling me about it, then I got interested. And then after sitting down, I see so many parallels. Um, I mean, you are a houndsman. You are training a dog. You're free casting a hound to go out and pursue game and catch game. And that is that is awesome. And then the parallels between law enforcement mm-hmm. and, and uh, <laughs> what you do is amazing, you know. Uh, but I think the message that that I will close with is, you know, as much as hounds or houndsmen are under fire from seems like every direction, but the the non hunting public and the anti hunting public, you're doing a great service here for the wildlife and the resource. Uh, a wounded deer is not going to go off and die a quiet death with his family members, and and say his final goodbyes and it's going to be a brutal it's going to be brutal it's going to be a brutal coyotes. death mm-hmm. he's he's going to he's going to die of infection eventually be fall to predation from coyotes um you know so for the humane side of this thing you're doing a great service for the wildlife with what you're doing and that's the the narrative that we need to keep up front is you know, if you know you can't catch a deer, you're not going to keep hammering. You're not out there to turn a dog loose on a deer that you can't catch so that you can kill a deer. You're out there following a deer, pursuing a deer, tracking a deer that you know is not going to have a good ending. Mm-hmm. He's going to have a brutal death in the end if you do not do this. Plus, you're helping fellow sportsmen. I think that's just a win-win. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. I really do. So, Travis, I appreciate your time. I appreciate y'all coming down. I'm glad we could make it all work. I, I'm so glad, Shorty. Thanks, Shorty. I will. Appreciate I, it. I finally did something good. <laughs> <laughs> well, we close every one of these podcasts out. we got kind of a tagline at the end of it. And uh, uh, in your case, we got a blood track here. It's, it's headed off, and you know you're going to catch this deer. So, Travis, you follow your hounds, and I'll follow mine. Yes, sir. All right. <laughs>